Uh, my name is Will Ruth, and uh, I actually learned from the earlier uh, events that I should state that I, that I was once a rower. I don't have that on this slide, but I did my junior rowing uh, in Olympia, Washington, and then went to college at Western Washington and thought that I was going to leave rowing behind. I played lacrosse, started competing in strength sports, and did an internship with the varsity track and field team, got me into kinesiology, it was in the gym a lot, knew some of the rowers uh, from, from earlier days, and it would help them out. And they said, well, hey, this is really great, sort of on a one-on-one -on -one basis, can, can you come and work with the rest of the team? So I started riding along with the head coach and just listening to what he said and, and the kinds of uh, uh, corrections and technical cues that he was trying to give the rowers. And then he and I started talking about, well, what if there's something else going on? What if it's not just the, the technical problems? What if there's a structural problem or a strength issue or mobility issue? And it was really helpful for me as an early coach to, to hear exactly what his problems were and then start thinking about, okay, what can I do just to solve that one? And so that was the only place I started and then built up from there. I did uh, ended up coaching on the water as well because we were a club program and you got to do what you got to do to keep boats going uh, when you're a club program. And we get a lot of uh, co coaching turnover. I, my wife got a job in Central Vermont. We made the move earlier, so I'm, I'm recently moved out there and now get to go coach the Craftsbury uh, Sculling Center. So that's sort of the longer arc. During my last year at Western, we had a new head coach come in. I was in grad school, I was in a biomechanics class. and. I had to do a research review on some topic that was relevant to our coaching. That year, we had more low back pain and ribs injuries than I had seen in my previous five years with the program. And so I wanted to know, I sort of had this unfortunate necessity of wanting to know why these problems were happening. I had my own sort of thoughts and suspicions, but I wanted to know with this research project what what actually was going on in, in, in a broader level. So this is sort of a year and a half later, what I'm gonna to present today was my findings from a research-based perspective, as well as <coughs> some of my own experience uh, and, and as we go. So I do wanna say first a big thank you to the researchers whose research I'm using in this, in this presentation. I'm a strength coach, I'm not a physical therapist, I'm not a clinician, uh, I'm not a, even an academic researcher. I could just read studies and know how to interpret them and work to apply them, but without them, I would only have my own ideas. So the fact that they've gone out and done these studies with broader populations, rowers across different times, different cultures, different communities, different levels, uh, this is really useful information for us to have as coaches. And so my goal is just to basically take this work that they've done and, and get that into coach and athlete education and into my own my own coaching practices. So what I'm going to hope to present today, go next to the big picture, uh, is at its fundamental, what the research indicates is that low back pain and rib stress injuries are overuse injuries. Fundamentally, they're related to volume, load, and rapid progression of volume and or load. And the reason that volume, load, and rapid progression is a problem is because it causes excess stress and strain on skeletal structures not just alliterative, that is actually sort of what we know about the mechanism. Uh, the actual mechanisms of injury is a little bit of a black box in terms of exactly why excess stress and strain on skeletal structures causes pain. And so they're still doing more research on that. It's funny that despite the amount of research we have and how much knowledge there is, we still don't exactly understand. There's some different theories on that. So uh, the how these injuries are achieved, mostly through prolonged jerking which research defines as 30 or more minutes continuous, use of static ergs for volume and load, and use of hatchet blades for load. And then there's also some factors because uh, despite what, what we were doing on the team, not everybody got hurt. So there had to be some individual factors for why some individual athletes got hurt and some people didn't get hurt and some people PR'd from, from the same training that, that was having a different effect across. And so some of those individual factors uh, previous history of injury, so once you have one injury, you are more likely to have another injury, and even rib stress injury, low back pain is a risk factor. So we'll talk about the relationship of those two injuries and why I've combined them in this same presentation. Uh, but at, at, the, at, at its core, once you have one, you're more likely to have another. The hip range of motion and strength 
is, is an individual factor. And so I'm going to go more into each of these as we go through the presentation. And then there are technical factors too. So we'll talk about some that are, that are sort of stroke style and also some that are just an individual making an error and how it compounds itself over, over the stroke cycle. And ultimately, the goal is to reduce, o reduce overall risk of injury so that we can reduce the first incidence of injury so that then we can reduce the overall rates uh, across the sport. Can I ask, before we go, how many people have experienced a low back injury themselves or coached athletes, athletes who have experienced low back injuries? Please keep that hand up and then raise the other one if it's rib stress injuries. <clears throat> and so that's almost 100%, at least one way or the other. That's a big problem for our sport. In the research, about 51%, up, up to 51% of athletes can experience a low back injury in a year of training. They cause the highest frequency of missed practice in terms of no, number of missed practices per, per athlete. Uh, and again, history of injury is predictive of future injury. So reducing that first one is huge to reducing the next one, the one after that, the one through the rest of the athlete's career. Rib stress injuries is less, uh, less frequent, down to 10 to 12% per year, but because it's a bone injury versus a muscular injury, the recovery time is much longer. In some studies, up to 47 to 60 days of, of missed time, depending on the severity of the injury. And therefore, it's the most missed practice time and, and competing time per injury. And again, based on the number of hands up, we know that this is a problem. It's a problem on a couple different levels. There are some coaches, and depending on the level that you coach, this might be an appropriate perspective, that not getting injured is the athlete's responsibility. That my job as a coach is to put the fastest boat out there, and how many athletes get injured in that process is just an unfortunate consequence of, of performance. Uh, there are other coaches who believe that keeping more athletes in the program is more of a programmatic goal, and I think you can make an argument either way for me, coaching in a club system as, as the bulk of my time, uh, these athletes were not going on to national teams, to Olympic teams, uh, to become professional rowers, if that's, if that's even a thing. Uh, and so I also saw it in the bigger picture that especially with the Western team, we lost about a third of our athletes in that year to injury themselves or to seeing their friends get injured and said, you know what, this isn't for me. Like, if I wanted to get this hurt, I'd go play rugby. <laughs> So for us, it, it became an issue where we had fewer athletes in seat races, overall, overall less competitive votings, fewer athletes in our, in our fundraising. Uh, again, we're a club program, so reliant on dues, reliant on rent to rower. And so I think there's, there's a bigger injury picture uh, for the sport than just whether or not it affects that, that individual athlete or that individual vote. So we're going a little bit from the, the, the why of the injury and, and into more of the how. The static erg, everybody knows that the difference between the static erg and the dynamic erg is the static erg, the foot plate's stable, the dynamic erg, both, both ends are moving, just like in the boat, the foot plate and, and the seat are, are mobile. What that results in, in the static erg, is we see higher peak forces, we see more upper body contribution, we see lower mechanical efficiency. And that it all has to do with the athlete having to reverse their momentum, 100% of their momentum, on, on the slide versus the dynamic erg where we've got lower peak forces overall and a proportionately higher amount of lower body contribution and overall higher mechanical efficiency. It could be up to 10% of, of static erg efficiency is just sort of lost by, by the athlete having to reverse their, their time. So 10% of the drive phase is sucked up with just reversing momentum. And under prolonged erging conditions, going into the, into the 30 minute barrier. I don't think there's anything magic that happens between 29 and 31 minutes, but when you're studying something academically, sort of you just have to pin down things and, and, and make it consistent across conditions. And so 30 minutes was what the researchers have chosen uh, as, as far as defining prolonged erging. What we basically see with, with prolonged erging is that everything that's sort of a fault of the static erg gets magnified. And those the, the later breaking force curve of, of the dynamic erg, or sorry, the, the later breaking force curve of the static erg becomes later under prolonged conditions as everything shifts more toward the back end of the stroke. So we see decreased early drive power, uh, decreased peak force, uh, sorry, delayed peak force and a delayed finish position, more spinal extension and flexion, more on static ergs, more vertebrae side to side motion. 
which you would think would happen on dynamic ergs, you wouldn't necessarily expect on static ergs, but as the athlete fatigues, we introduce more of this spinal motion. And so this is again, the, the idea of the mechanism of injury for, for the lumbar spine injury is that it is that passive stretching and loading of spinal tissues in, in the skeleton that then starts to cause injury over time. Uh, and then less lower body contribution, again, because the whole force curve, because the, the force is shifting toward the back end of the stroke, we see less and less up front and more and more on the back end and the way that it loads the spine uh, and, and therefore the rib cage. What's the actual effect of this on injury rates then? So we can work backwards on this picture. If we know that these things happen on static ergs compared to dynamic ergs, and we know that when we're doing prolonged erging that these things happen, then okay, what's the, what's the next layer of actual effect on the athlete? And so in one study, uh, and this is 2002, so it is a little bit older. Again, we usually look in sort of like 20 year chunks. I would love to see this replicated again. It was a questionnaire uh, study based, or questionnaire survey based study looking at athletes and low back pain and then their long term prognostic as well. They did a follow up study with the same groups of athletes. And they found that low back pain was most likely to develop in winter and then spring compared to summer and fall. And so that basically lines up with when we're doing the most intense workloads. In a, another study, this was on um, 20 international level Irish rowers and another research review, they found a high correlation of erg training load to injury. So basically the more that you erg, the higher the risk of injury. In the 76 elite New Zealand rowers, this was a great study. I've got another slide demonstrating this after this one. Uh, they looked at Team New Zealand 2011 at all three <coughs> levels. So they had juniors, U23, and senior athletes. A whole year of training. And again, studies, uh, surveys based on low back pain, whether or not they were experiencing, how, how severe it was, and then they could look at what those, what those variables were. So they found higher training hours, higher erg hours per month, higher low back pain. Higher average hours, higher average meters, higher low back pain more low back pain in the month when athletes return to training. That one was particularly severe. So here we've got the uh, prevalence of injury and then the workload in, in total hours per month. So this is across all, all 76 athletes, combine all their hours, and then the line of injury. This was total injuries and, and total workload hours. And then this one was new low, low back injuries. It's the same thing, we go from off season, so summertime, low, lower training, lower injuries. October, they return to training, boom. Was that like a three-fold increase in, in training time in, in one month? And well, is there a severity index on, those, on these people? Like meaning I've got a, a tweak and I've got a Oh my God, this is so yeah, they deep. did. They categorized them between incidental and minor, where the athlete just experiences it but doesn't need to miss or modify a training session. And then moderate, where they had to modify or miss at least one training session. And then major, where they were down for at least a month or uh, between a week and one month. And they actually found, too, that three athletes were tired from low back injury during this study time, uh, which was about 4% of the study population. And the authors note that that's lower than the collegiate average where athletes were tiring due to, due to back pain in, in, in a one-year training period. What happens at the spine affects what happens at the rib cage. The stroke is a cycle, so we can't isolate one area and say, well, this is only happening here because that's going to compound as the athlete takes stroke after stroke within one stroke from, from recovery to drive and then back to recovery again, and then as well as, as the training compounds. So the basic idea is that if we decrease the early drive force, whether through the technology that we use or through our training methods. And we increase late drive force because with novice and experienced rowers alike, if you say, hold this split, they'll find a way to hold the split. Even if that means making subconscious or conscious technical modifications in order to do so. Then we add training time, meters, stroke after stroke, and we get either lumbar spine stress and strain or rib cage stress and strain. So I've highlighted a couple quotes from different studies here. Uh, just again demonstrating that connection of we've introduced more year-round higher volume erg training uh, that's enabled rowers to apply higher loads to the rib cage we see more <clears throat> micro damage from from rib stress and then a subsequent rib stress fracture 
the, the term over the last 20 years has changed from rib stress fracture to rib stress injury, by the way, because they found that rowers and coaches were not really taking it seriously until it fractured. Uh, a rib stress injury just encompasses the whole spectrum of chest, wall, bone injury. It does not need to become a full fracture. Uh, and we actually had a doctor with a lot of rowing experience in my first presentation. He says that it, within the first week of the rib stress injury, really don't bother going to get imaging or x-ray done because it often doesn't show up. Uh, and if it, if it does or if it doesn't, it's sort of inconclusive in the bigger picture. So I'll, I'll talk more about how we diagnose the injury, but I think it's important to bring up that the, the rib stress injury is not just a full fracture. It might be a, a stress fracture or a traumatic full fracture, but uh, the, the overall picture of rib stress injury is, is pain in the chest wall area. So all this about erging, is the erg bad? I had, I had one coach in my first session who said, well, then why do it? Since 1990, these injuries have increased. More low back pain, more rib stress injuries since 1990 when, when the static erg um, was, was sort of become co commercially available. All world records have also been set since 1990. So there's a performance enhancing effect to volume, to load, to specificity. But there's the other side of the coin too, which is that higher specificity, higher volume, higher load can also cause injury. So as rowing coaches, whether you're coaching juniors, masters, collegiate, international level, we're always sort of working with this relationship of how specific can we get training to enhance performance and how much can we back off to spare the athlete from overuse to, to the spine and to the rib. So I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with, with the concept to static ergometer. I think if you can use dynamics, then great, but not everybody has the money or the space or the ability to just make a wholesale shift over dynamics. And importantly, dynamics are new enough so that pretty much all of our injury research is based on static ergs, not on dynamic ergs. And we don't actually know yet that dynamic ergs are safer in terms of reducing injuries through their use. So I'm looking forward to seeing when that study happens. Got to happen eventually. If you have 50 or 60 rowers available and you don't mind having half of them do statics and half of them do dynamics, uh, then let some academic researcher know because that's basically how this has to happen. Is some coach has to volunteer. We're going to do the same training plan on this equipment versus that equipment and we're going to look over a whole year of training, what injuries happen, and, and can we start to put those data points down for is this actually safer than, than this. So we're going to talk more about how to modify those if you have access to, to both statics and dynamics or if you, if you can choose between one or the other. We'll, we'll talk more about that. But part of the reason too that I'm resistant to saying, oh, we'll just use dynamics and then it's not a problem, is one, it's not fair to the people who can't afford dynamics to say, well, sorry, you're just going to have low back pain and rib stress injuries and that's that and you should save your money for dynamics. That, that doesn't work for me. I also don't want to present the idea that using dynamics is carte blanche to do whatever volume and workloads you want because again, we don't know that that actually is uh, a, a safer approach. So I will say that pretty much the, all of the signs are pointing towards dynamics being superior for performance, for reducing per stroke load on the athlete, for all these reasons that we know. But that doesn't make the concept too static bad. It just makes it a different tool in, in our coaching toolbox. Volume and load happens on water too. What I'm really sensitive to is combining risk factors. So like you said, if we're rowing into a headwind, up current with, less, with, with a pair in an eight and hatchet blades then, and, and low rate, then okay, we're doing really, really high, high stroke load. So we're combining these factors if we're also doing high volume erging on static machines that were just piling more and more force on the athlete. Uh, so again, just the relationship of low back pain to rib stress injuries. Uh, they've done some studies and found that poor <coughs> trunk strength endurance and poor trunk mobility and flexibility is a risk factor for a rib stress injury. So we can look at that from a low back perspective and also from a rib stress perspective because if the athlete has less range of motion at the hip or at the trunk, they're going to achieve more of that stroke force with the upper body. And that's basically what I say in that. Bottom part is that less lumbar spine movement means a shorter stroke, more upper body movement, different force curve, and then increased force on the rib cage. So we can look at this from a technical factor, as well as from a physical factor, as well as from a workload factor. Uh, this is basically what, what, what I call the, the, the low back pain and rib stress injury stroke. Uh, if, you, if you were in the session yesterday with Joe, then, then you saw this again. The slumped out posterior, a lot of force on, on the back of the seat, a lot of force on the posterior elements of the lumbar spine, 
the rounded forward shoulder. Again, not all of these need to be present, but these are just some of the major technical factors that, that I saw. Uh, the, the, the rounded shoulder just becomes worse as the athlete leaves the back end of the stroke into the front end, shove the shoulders forward, the, the, the shoulders are way shrugged up. Reach not achieved through the hips, reach achieved through the spine and the shoulders. And then all of this just magnifies as the athlete gets into the catch. They'll either be over compressed if they have the mobility for it. I don't hear. So you can see that the seat is starting to tuck under because that's the other fault that you'll see is either the athlete over compresses or the athlete slides under. And then that shoulder, who's, who's seen that shoulder rebound at, at the catch where the athlete sort of lunges out for, for extra, um, extra reach right at the front end? It never helps them because they're in this extreme protracted position. The blade's in the water. They apply force with the legs and it can't go through a stable kinetic chain to actually get to the handle and blade. So we can address some of these technical factors, both from a, do you understand why this is a problem technically? Do you have the technical knowledge to execute this under low intensity conditions? And then do you have the muscular ability uh, or, the, or the mobility to get into those positions and then to sustain those positions as we develop force under a high fatigue condition? So these are some of the things that make it such a risk in rowing is that we do a, a high load, high fatigue, high effort sport, and we've got to sort of put some, some protective mechanisms in place for the athlete. Yeah, right. Individual factors, again, previous history of injury is, is a big one. Uh, hip range of motion on, on the spine, and because the spine is more of a muscular overuse injury, rowing before 16, this NCAA study found co correlation between rowers who started rowing and, and especially specializing in rowing early had higher incidence of low back pain as collegiate rowers. Uh, and so there's certainly a factor where we want athletes to be at least doing different sports uh, so that we can just sort of cut down on their, on their total year-round volume. And there was grip stress injury because it's a bone injury. We, it's a little bit more multifactorial. We get into some other areas of, of injury. So uh, red S, who's familiar with that term? Who's familiar with the female athlete triad? Okay, red S is the new term for that because the International Olympic Committee got together a, a panel of doctors, researchers, professionals in the field and, and decided that energy availability, EA, uh, low energy uh, availability, low calorie diets affect male athletes as well as female athletes, especially if they're lightweights, and especially if they're in a high calorie sport like rowing, where we're burning a lot of calories, we're not also replacing those, you're gonna be in a low energy setting, whether you're male or female. Um, and then for, for women, it affects far more than just menstrual function and bone mineral density, and it also affects a, a cascade of, of physiological problems for males as well as females beyond that. So red S is the relative energy deficiency in sport. And all of those papers, because it's a, a, a you know, pathway thing, they're, they're all available online and they've, and they've tried to put out coach education says this has just been the last uh, maybe three or four years uh, that they started trying to put out more, more information about, about red S for coaches beyond, beyond just the female athlete triad. So uh, that's that. And then a couple other factors that they found with this. Lightweight rower, female rower, and low back injury, we've sort of covered those already. If you've got a low back injury, you might be doing something to protect that area. If you're still trying to achieve a high output because you're a competitive rower, and that's what we do, then you're going to achieve that stroke force from somewhere else. So the highly segmented stroke style comes from the Thornton and Venter uh, 2018 study, and they looked at shoulder flexion angle of Injury, uh, of rowers who had already experienced a rib stress injury but were not currently experiencing symptoms against rowers of similar level, so they did matched controls who did not have a history of rib stress injury. And they found that the rowers with rib stress injury tended to have a higher shoulder flexion angle, stronger biceps compared to quadriceps, and generally more upper body force contribution. So there's a bit of chicken and the egg there where did they exhibit that stroke style and that, that muscular patterning because they had already had an injury and they're developing this as a, as a compensatory mechanism? Or were those factors existing before and that's what led to their injury? So we can sort of look at that from both ways. The shoulder flexion angle is basically the, the, the body over. So from the segmented stroke style, the more the legs go down and the more the hips go back, the more you hold the torso over, the more that shoulder flexion angle is going to be is going to be increased. So this is one of the few sort of technical factors that they've been able to look into in a stroke style thing. Again, I'm not saying that if you row 
a, a segmented stroke style versus a more natural stroke style that you're going to get a rib stress injury versus being protected from rib stress injury. That's how we're looking at. We're just looking at various risk factors here. And again, that combination of risk factors. So a couple things that are not risk factors, at least as far as the current studies that we've seen, uh, are sweep versus skull on either. So the, the research across those, again, there's less research on masters athletes sort of overall. Uh, most of the research is on, is on junior collegiate and elite populations because they're easier to pin down. Mostly we know where they're gonna be, when they're gonna be, so we can study them. So sort of what, what is easy to study becomes studied. And we definitely need more research on, on different populations. One study, uh, again, this was 1997, would love to see it replicated, did not find that the sit and reach hamstring test had a correlation to low back pain. This was working specifically with uh, rowers and dancers. The study selected those two populations uh, for having high quadriceps use um, and, and generally high incidence of low back pain. And so they looked at a bunch of different metrics for that, and we'll talk more about that study later on because there were some interesting findings from that. But they, they did not find that hamstring flexibility as measured by the sit and reach was correlated to low back pain. There have been other studies too that have done the straight leg raise um, and found that total flexibility is not important, but a side to side difference was important. So if you were significantly more flexible on your left side of the straight leg raise than the right side, more likely to get the low back injury. But overall flexibility, not necessarily a factor. And the study that looked at erg volume also correlated a bunch of different things that the rowers were doing and looked at their incidence of low back pain. And they found that rowers who were doing core stability training had a slight, slightly higher, not significantly higher, but trending in that direction, incidental low back pain. So maybe there's something going on there. Maybe that's training practices. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's a fault for how we're approaching core training. That's, we'll talk about that later too. With rib stress injury, stroke side is not a factor. And that was something that I thought was, oh, well, this athlete says they have pain on their inside side, so maybe it's not that big of a deal because it's the outside side where they're stretching out more and there's going to be more stress in that area. Um, that is actually not a factor. So I think it's important kind of debunking some of my own, my own thoughts or biases about it. And then adaptive rowing is, again, we don't have enough, enough studies on, on that population. This was one that looked at an adaptive rower who had a rib stress injury and studied his return to training, and they found that the chest strap that, that was allowing him to row in the first place was re-aggravating the injury and became a factor because since he's an adaptive rower, they could not exactly say, uh, well, just go do cross training, go, go, go hit the bike, go for a run instead. So it was this really tough puzzle of how do we train this athlete enough to be able to return to rowing uh, and how do we avoid aggravating those, those same conditions. So I think we need more, more studies there. Uh, but that was just the one that I found there. So yeah. we'll leave, uh, that, that's sort of the major diagnosis of, of why the injuries are happening. And now I'm going to go more into the prevention plan for what we can do to start reducing injuries. Uh, I do, I say prevention plan here, really it's reduction plan because I think prevention puts an unfair burden uh, on, on, on the coach uh, and, and on the athlete to think that, okay, we can get to a point where we have 0% injuries. But as a coach, I can live with the occasional injury if it, if it is truly occasional, and if I can look back at my program and see I'm doing this to mitigate risk, I'm doing this, I'm looking at these things. So um, I'm mostly talking about reduction plan here. And for low back pain, most people know what low back pain feels like. It's easier to identify than, than rib stress injury. General pain in the lumbar area that sort of comes and goes, maybe you can warm up through it, maybe it's fine after a few strokes, maybe it comes back, maybe it happens more when you sit. Uh, but pretty much everybody can identify that as, as general muscular low back pain. So I think that most of what I found there is that it was helpful to debunk some of the myths about how low back pain eventually goes away. And the idea of a back strain and that you could just row through it is, is usually not the case. Uh, I think we need to treat the low back injury as an injury, not just as, uh, oh, well, you know, yeah, your back hurts, but you're just going to row through it. Anyway, I think that's sort of a decision to make between athlete and coach for when you might just row through it, but acknowledging in the bigger picture that that's, that that's not the best practice. And that sort of goes into, uh, this study looked, it was a qualitative study looking at rowing coaches and clinicians for, for how they approached low back pain with athletes and what strategies that they felt were effective. And one researcher in particular talked about being non-alarmist with injury, that on one hand, we don't want to scare rowers away from rowing by saying, here's all the bad things that can happen to you as a rower, and, and 
here's this, and oh, well, you know, the erg is going to make your low back. So, you know, like, we, we, we don't want to put those ideas in their head, but nor do we want to shelter them from injury so much that when they get injured, it's this, you know, oh, what's going to happen now? We can sort of work to take the mystery out of it by approaching it from that not alarmist perspective. One coach I've coached with, come to you a sec, um, we were going into a higher volume block of training, maybe six weeks, winter training, who's maybe looking at this picture when they come back from winter break. Uh, and, and he told all the athletes, he said, hey, we're going to do this. The spring season's really important. So if anybody has low back pain, we're just shutting you down. Well, what do you think happened? Nobody fessed up when their backs hurt because he had created this sort of alarmist perspective. No, no, no athlete's going to want to say, excuse me, coach, please shut me down now for, for, the, for the next five weeks. I'll just take my chances. So what he sort of created was this alarmist environment uh, where low back pain became really feared because they didn't want to be shut down. And so it's important to have this dialogue of, of what are the symptoms, what are you feeling, what's happening, and, and what can we do to progress. If you get injured, what are we doing then to, to rehab and eventually return to running? Question? Uh, I think that working with uh, calling pain a signal mm -hmm. rather than any, anything else is sure. a good way to conceptualize what to do about pain. Yeah. And yeah. that's the word I'd like to use. And that sort of gets into the fear avoidant topic too, is they found that some athletes who, who thought of pain differently <laughs> were, were then more avoidant of, of activities that caused pain that, that maybe wasn't actually problematic pain. That, that, it, that it was just incidental or that it was just soreness or that, or, you know, muscular soreness that got mischaracterized as injurious pain. So I think it's important to just have these conversations. The fear of avoidant behaviors is particularly true with, with athletes who are returning to rowing. If they've been shut down, when they come back to erging, it's like, oh, that's, that's scary. That's, that, that's what hurt me initially. So what these researchers talked about is, can we find a way for the athlete to continue doing some of those activities? Can we get them into rowing just for the skill and drill portion, not for the actual pieces portion. Can we do erging uh, with a low resistance or a reduced range of motion, or even just sit on the erg and go through the motion so that we're still sort of using the tools that we're gonna have the athlete return to so that we don't get into those avoidance cycles when they do eventually uh, return to training. Or if it's weights, or wh whatever it is, if it's a different modality of training. With rib stress injuries, I find it much more important to educate on the symptoms because they're Athletes generally are less familiar with this than they are with low back pain. And so rib stress injury, uh, the way that it, it, it's, it's sort of an insidious start a lot of times, it will, it will begin in, in subtle ways, not exactly easy to, to identify right off the bat. And pain on deep breathing when opening doors with that arm, the, the pushing and pulling with the straight arm, side sleeping, coughing, sneezing, all tend to be things that aggravate rib stress injury. Um, and, and so if an, if an athlete says, oh man, it really hurts when I cough, then that's kind of a, a, a red flag to have a little bit more of a conversation there. It could be anterior, mostly it is anterior. It tends to be ribs five through eight, the front side, um, but it can, it can also be posterior. The rib cage goes all the way around. Um, pain in the shoulder blade area could be a rib stress injury. <coughs> as well. Um, again, not related to stroke side, tends to be tender to the touch in, in the general area, um, and it's often misdiagnosed as an intercostal strain. Who's heard of an, inter of an intercostal strain, a cartilage strain? Yeah. Um, really common to be misdiagnosed. Yes. This comes from the Evans and Redgrave uh, Great Britain Rib Stress Injury Pathway article that they did, where sort of like the IOC did with Red S, they convened a, a panel of a bunch of different researchers and doctors produced this document aimed for rowers, rowing coaches, strength coaches, and especially medical practitioners who maybe were familiar with rowing and maybe weren't familiar with rowing to say, hey, here's the risks for our sport. Here's some of the intrinsic risk factors, what's happening in the athlete. Here's some of the ex extrinsic risk factors, what we're doing on the water and in training that can cause these injuries. Because if you go to a doctor and you say, oh, well, it hurts my rib cage and it hurts under these conditions, they'll usually say, oh, it's probably an intercostal strain because in a general population, that's probably true. In a rowing population where you're exerting mechanical stress on the rib cage, it's usually a rib stress injury, not an intercostal strain. Like it's really important to clear that up and when the athlete goes to the doctor and they come back to you and they say, oh, he says it's just an intercostal strain, I'll take a week off and I'll be okay. Be careful with that. Monitor them closely as they come back. And, and, and see if, if it actually is.
from a strength training perspective, what I do for two to three hours a week with an athlete doesn't really offset what the rowing coach might be doing with them for 12 to 15 hours a week. Uh, so I talk a lot about the rowing workload factors, but the strength training is a factor of, of uh, is, this, is a factor in total workload for the athlete as well. And so we do see increased risk of injury. That NCAA 2002 study said, well, strength training could be a factor for low back injury too. And it is true, especially when it's poorly instructed, poorly supervised, or poorly executed, that, that if you're not monitoring athletes as they're doing the exercise, providing adequate coaching as they go, providing adequate instruction, uh, but if the athlete's not doing things correctly, then they can increase their risk of rib stress injury uh, or, or low back pain. And if we're using high, high volumes and loads, then we're just adding to the same workload that the athlete might already be experiencing growing. Um, and then for rib stress injuries in particular, bench pulls and bench presses exert extra stress and strain on the rib cage area. In the bench pull, the athlete's lying down. Sometimes, if they're from a real hardcore rowing program, they're lying down on a two by four or a piece of plywood, which I love. It's not even a padded bench. We're just exerting direct, hard, compressive force onto the rib cage. And then usually they're doing it under high load or high fatigue conditions slamming the bar in. Maybe you're doing a six minute test. Maybe you're doing a three rep max test and you're arching the back and everything to get it there. And it's just, it's all putting more and more pressure right on the anterior area of the rib cage. Ribs five through eight, we already see those injuries. And the same thing with the, with the barbell bench press. If the athlete's bringing it down and making hard contact on that area, or even as they're pushing against it, they're, they're putting resultant force on, on the posterior side of the rib cage too in the same way. Oh, yeah. uh, mostly in strength training research, uh, for these injuries, we see decreased risk of injury. So if, if for low back pain, we're using strength training to teach lumbo-pelvic coordination, if you were in the talk with, with Joe yesterday, we talked a lot about lumbo-pelvic coordination. This is the, the hip hinge motion of using the lumbar spine, lumbo, and the pelvis uh, to create motion, not just pelvic rotation. Who's heard of anterior pelvic tilt? Pelvis can rotate. Ro rotate this way. Anterior pelvic tilt gets a bad name because in general populations, again, you're usually looking at anterior pelvic tilt, tight hip flexors, slack hamstrings, excess lumbar extension, and we see low back pain. In rowing, however, the pelvis has to rotate anteriorly and posteriorly in order to achieve range of motion through the hips, not just through the lumbar spine via flexion and extension. So we've got to be able to teach this, and that's what the hip hinge does. Um, and various hip hinge movements, the Romanian deadlift, the kettlebell swing, the band or cable pull through. We'll talk more about that uh, with, the, with the strength training stuff. Um, with the 1997 study that looked at the sit and reach test and the low back pain, they found that what was important was not the hamstring flexibility, but the ratio of quadriceps strength and hamstring strength. So athletes whose hamstrings were lower than 45% as strong as the quadriceps, so basically hamstrings significantly weaker, quadriceps significantly stronger, those were the athletes that had greater low back pain. And that it, it progressed in a stepwise fashion as well. So the greater the, the, the disparity between the two, the more incidence of low back pain that, that the athlete had. And then those researchers went on to take a group of rowers who missed training time in the previous six months due to low back pain, gave them a hamstring strengthening protocol for the next six months, and monitored how many practices they missed due to low back pain and found less low back pain with those rowers who had previously experienced injury with increasing the hamstring strength. They tested the hamstring strength too. It did actually increase their hamstring strength. They did not change their hamstring flexibility during that time of study and they reduced their low back pain. So uh, that made me get a lot more hamstring work in my programs. And then the rib stress injury I talked already about the quadriceps to the bicep strength ratio. The, the injury or that the athletes with rib stress injury tended to have stronger upper bodies compared to weaker lower bodies. Chicken and the egg, but ultimately we're trying to increase lower body force so that the athlete could develop more early drive force, more lower body, keep it off of the spine and the rib cage more. And then with the serratus anterior, uh, that is the muscle that runs from the medial border of the scapula around the rib cage and attaches into the front side of the rib cage. It's also called the boxer muscle because it's the protractor. So when boxers punch through their punches, that, that activates that highly. And they found that strengthening that muscle um, is typically involved in rib stress injury rehab protocols and may have a protective effect. So strengthening that area to reducing incidence of low back or, or of, of rib stress injury. That's one I'd like to see studied more, but it's not hard to do extra work for that area. 
the push-up and push-up plus anytime we're getting into that protraction. And athletes will do this when they're rowing too. They go into protraction. So sort of my idea as a strength coach is if they're going to do it in the boat, then let's find a way to train that same range of motion on land to get them developing that motor control as well as developing those muscles. So anything that gets that protraction is going to engage the serratus anterior. Again, from, from the strength training perspective, what I do is try to start by instructing, supervising, and helping athletes properly execute the movements as much as possible. Try to keep the force muscular away from the skeleton. I mean, we, we want athletes to, to, to do a good job with lifting. We use mostly full body compound free weight exercises, not machines and, and bench poles and stuff that's gonna put them in an isolated environment. If they're going to have to develop force through the long range of motion of the rowing stroke, the whole kinetic chain from ankles to knees to hips to spine to torso to shoulders to wrists, then I want to be training in that same fashion too, not locking them down in certain ranges of motion to developing muscles in isolation. So most of what I do with junior collegiate and master's athletes alike is find full body movements that they can do. We'll scale that to the athlete's ability. Um, but for the most part, we're always going to use some sort of full body uh, compound moving their body through space exercise. And emphasize uh, leg, lower body, and shoulder area muscles. So again, trying to build those areas that can produce stroke force muscularly and keep it away from the skeleton uh, is important towards reducing those technical factors that can set the athlete up for increased risk of injury. And the two, uh, lumbopelvic and four-way scapular coordination, are where we get into the, is it the motor coordination? Is it the athlete's ability to move? Versus is it their strength uh, and, their, and, their, and their actual muscle mass? So the shoulders, a four-way joint, the, that, the hip hinge is pretty easy to teach. We went over that one. Um, the shoulder can protract, the shoulder can retract, it can internally rotate, and it can externally rotate. And how often do, you do, do, do we do external rotation in rowing? Never, right? So if we're only training from this internal rotation and from this mostly retraction with some protraction, it's not loaded protraction, so we're not really training that, that range of motion. If the athlete doesn't have the motor coordination to move through those ranges of motion, we can't expect them to do it adequately on the water. Um, so I'm always using different exercises. The YWT rays I demonstrated yesterday were making letters Y, W, and T, but from this hip hinged position, trying to focus on keeping the shoulders in the back pockets, shoulders back and down as we do this to get that between the shoulder blade area to light up, um, as well as external rotation exercises like the face pull, where we've got the cable or the band, and we're pulling the band apart like this, band pull aparts, all that stuff that gets the athlete moving into those uh, ranges of motion as well as using the muscles that aren't necessarily used during rowing training are all important toward building up the shoulder girdle to produce force and, and not have it go through the rib cage instead. Uh, I don't use the bench pull. It's the one lift that I will not use in, in rowing training because there's too many other ways to train the scapular retractors, the lats, the biceps. We could do so much more than the, than the bench pull that there's no point in a sport where 12% of athletes are injured from group stress injuries and it costs up to 60 days when an athlete gets injured. I'm just not going to use it. I'll, I'll, use, I'll use a half dozen other things instead. Um, or, the, or the barbell bench press. We'll use dumbbells, we'll do push-up variations, we'll do things that still work in those same areas, but without that rib compressed effect. And then periodization just means organizing training. So from a strength training perspective, it means that I'm avoiding high overlap with rowing training. So that if we're doing high volume on the ergs or on the water, or we're doing high load on the, on the water, uh, maybe we're doing a phase of added resistance where we're using bungees, we're using cans, we're doing low rate, we're doing pairs by eights, whatever it is, then I'm going to try to avoid overloading that with what we're doing in the gym. This is part of why it's so important to have a year-round training picture that when athletes go home for summer break or when they're not in intense rowing training time, that's when we can do more strength training time. And I know that that's hard from especially a collegiate perspective if they're all going home or from a junior perspective if you don't have contact time with the athletes in the off-season. Uh, but that's a, that's a real area we're working with the strength with, with the strength coach or a strength training program can help teaching the athletes how to do it year round. So then hopefully they can make use of that reduced rowing training time to do more strength training time, build their bodies, gain strength, gain muscle, and then when they come back to rowing. Then okay, we're going to shift 
down in the strength training because we're going up in the rowing training. So we're always working with this sort of ebb and flow of training. If we're doing more rowing, then we're doing a little bit less strength training. We're going to change from high volume, then maybe we'll do lower volume, higher load. If we're doing higher load, then maybe we'll do some more volume work in the gym and, and stay off the load quite as much. So, uh, and then the core question is what we do about core stability training. So in that study that found small, small correlation between core stability training and low back pain, and what, what the researchers sort of speculated was that maybe it has to do with the core stability training the rowers are doing tends to be isometric. So what we mean by that is planks where the, the hip and, and the spine are, are not moving. We're just, we're just contracting from that position. <laughs> and when they've done uh, EMG studies looking at what muscles are actually doing in the rowing stroke, what they've found that the abdominal muscles do is they're really not that active at the front end where we would expect like based on a deadlift or a squat, like the highest prying force to happen is really not the most abdominal force. Where the most abdominal force happens is towards the back end of the stroke where, where the abdominals are working to slow down the, the layback. So as the, as the athlete goes through the layback, now the abdominal muscles are kicking in so they don't flatten out against, against the back. Um, so can we train the torso muscles in that similar fashion? I think plan planks and isometrics are fine at a, at a basic level. Like if we just need to develop musculature uh, and, and we need to teach just core contraction, period. But after that, once athletes have that skill down, let's not progress that to, to two minutes, four minutes, five minutes, endurance, marathon, planks, but let's start adding in different variations that introduce some hip movement and torso stability so that we're actually getting more similar to what the athlete's doing, moving the hips through the range of motion. Um, and then also make sure that we're working on the trunk extensors because the core is 360 degrees. And if we're only working core stability training via the abdominals, then we're sort of missing this whole trunk extensor phase, which is actually what's happening at the front end of the stroke where the forces are highest, if we're using hatchet blades, they're even higher. And if, if the trunks aren't strong, then the athlete's gonna do different things as they go through the, through the stroke cycle and put more stress and strain on a lumbar spine on the rib cage. So uh, one, I'll just demonstrate quickly, and you're welcome to try this as we go. Um, one sort of different torso uh, exercise that I like here is to have the athlete sitting. We'll go hands behind the head, shoulders back and down, so we're working on finding that neutral spine position. And we'll just rock back from here, from the layback to the body over, and trying to keep the torso really connected. And so if, you're, if you want, want to do this as we go, we'll try a fun variation where you can see my feet sort of lifting up. Now I'm using the hip flexor instead of the, instead of the, the abdominal muscles. So what we'll do now is have the athlete push their heels down and take the hip flexors out of the equation by activating the hip extensors, and now they're just using abdominal muscles. I found that even my strongest athletes will really struggle doing that because now they're just relying on the abdominal muscles. Ultimately, we'd rather have them doing that more in the boat, right? Keeping more connection through the foot plate, not relying on the hip flexors as much to get out of the bow. So if we can start to use these similar training methods by looking at what do they actually need to do in rowing, and can we use strength training or on land time or whatever to actually prepare the athlete for that instead of just sort of doubling down on the same old isometric training methods. These are just some general ideas for volume management from a rowing coach perspective is okay if our, if our source of volume is prolonged erging, um, here's why it's a risk factor and then here are my suggested considerations uh, for you as rowing coaches. So my goal is just to introduce the risk factors, start the brainstorming process on how we can approach these different combinations of volume, load, and progression, and then how you, in your own context, based on the athletes that you coach in your training situation, how you can start to manipulate those factors to hopefully reduce risk, reduce first incidents, reduce overall. So for prolonged erging, I think we've got a question, do we actually need to do prolonged erging? Or are we just doing prolonged erging just to do prolonged erging? Uh, can we cross-train? instead and get general aerobic system adaptations, the heart and the lungs and the mitochondria and the capillaries, those are whole body adaptations. You can get those from cycling, uh, swimming, skiing, running. So if we can introduce different modalities that we can get away from just, well, we have the ergs, so we're just gonna do 60, 90 minutes of steady state, whatever it is on it, just to get aerobic system adaptations because we're also then getting the overuse of those same structures. So again, it's that balance between the specificity, <coughs> which we know is performance enhancing, and the specificity that we know can also increase risk of injury. Uh, and then who's heard of the 60 second standing break per 10-ish minutes? 
continuous. This was a world growing article that um, published a few years ago that sort of proposed this as an idea to cut down on low back pain, especially around static erting. Um, and, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go into the mechanism more if we, if we have time. But I put a question mark by it because we don't actually know if it has an effect on injury rates yet. The appealing thing is that it doesn't cost us anything. Uh, it's just literally the athlete, if they're doing 60 minutes of, of prolonged erging, fine, let's break that up into, into six by 10, right? So we'll have them do 10 minutes and then stand up. When I've done this, it's been, there's the erg, there's your water bottle, there's you standing. We don't do planks, we don't do push-ups, we don't do burpees or something for the rest period. It's just 60 seconds of standing and, and letting your spine move in different directions. So we'll do sort of stretching this way, stretching that way, whatever. And the athlete doesn't leave, they don't go back to the cubbies, talk to their friends, whatever. Like 60 seconds is 60 seconds and then you're back on it. There's no negative effect on heart rate. You're back to where the heart rate you were before, especially if you're doing low intensity work. You're back to the same heart rate within a couple strokes. Um, and so sort of, I, I want to see it academically tested before really giving it a recommendation. In the meantime, while we wait for that, uh, it doesn't cost anything, and you might notice that it helps. Year-round rowing training, uh, again, static ergs allow us to do that, whereas before, if you were a Northern Hemisphere team, you just didn't row. <laughs> maybe, maybe you did something else, maybe you did cross training, maybe you just took three or four months off. Uh, even if you were a program that had like the early generation ergs, uh, you probably didn't have enough to get all of your athletes going on them at once, so volume was still reduced. So can we encourage off-season cross-training, encourage multi-sport participation, and then training camps and all this is where you were getting into, when we have those times when athletes come back from off-season training, it's really tempting as coaches to make up for lost time, force that adaptation to happen quickly. Uh, but our frequency can be high, we can still do Two, two to three sessions a day, whatever, if that's what we have the time for. If athletes are going on a winter training trip, like I'm not gonna say train once and then sit around for the other 20 hours of the day and, and play cards. Can we, again, use cross training for aerobic stuff, not rely on the erg quite as much? Can we reduce the per stroke load uh, through the strategies that we'll get into in the load management section? Can we emphasize the technical development instead of just making it about getting workload, workload, workload? Can we use different modalities of training so that, hey, we're gonna be on the water, for this short amount of time using hatchet blades. Then if we have spoons, maybe we'll use spoons for the other stuff because it's less load. Um, and, then, and then we'll do different styles of training for the different major training categories of goal. Load management, we're sort of going in similar directions, so I'll come back if anybody has questions after. Um, hatchet blades, again, if you have access to spoons, if you're doing high volume or doing high frequency training, maybe we can shift to using spoons for that and reduce per stroke load. So again, it's that picture of if we're doing high volume, high frequency, can we do lower, lower intensity, lower loading? Or if we're stuck with hatchets, fine, can we reduce load elsewhere? So can we erg on zero resistance or use dynamics if we have access to them? If we're doing high load on, on hatchets, then maybe we don't want to do high load on statics as well. <coughs> Again, dynamics is the question mark because we don't actually know if they are truly safer yet. Uh, but we do know that they're lower per stroke load, higher lower body force compared to, to lower upper body force. So overall, overall positive if you have access to them. Uh, and can we cross train, decrease fan resistance, etc. Added resistance rowing, I think too. Got a question, do we need it? Is this actually going to be an important factor for us? If so, okay, but gradually increase your volume and load. Emphasize the technique, make sure that athletes aren't changing their technique based on the load to some forces differently. If they're opening the backs really early because the load's really high at the start, but we don't actually want that technical adaptation to happen in the first place. And two, it's gonna increase low back pain and, and rib stress injury risk by, by increasing that torso force. And then low rate work, again, like I think low rate work is fine. I think if we're, if we're doing maybe 60 minutes of rate 20 work, then, then we've got to question that. But fine, if we're, if we're doing that, then let's reduce load elsewhere. So let's, let's try to do different things. So that, okay, we're doing low rate work because we want to develop technique. Therefore, we don't really care that much about the per stroke loading. So let's shut off the fan. Let's use spoons if we can. Let's not do low rate work and also row eights by pairs. Like let's reduce those total combinations uh, so we're just cutting down on total risk. <laughs> So looking at the, the whole, whole coaching picture. So before the injury happens, let's educate the athletes on 
the, the symptoms so that we know, hey, it's probably not an intercostal strain. If we, if we start getting rib stress pain, then here's how you can recognize it. Here are the things that we might do for low back pain. No, we're not just going to shut you down. We're still going to find other things that we can do. Um, and, and here's sort of talking to the athletes about this. <clears throat> Implementing your own coaching practices to manage all, all the stuff that we've been talking about through this. Again, I can sort of accept that, that injuries may happen as a performance competitive atmosphere if I'm looking at my program knowing that I'm doing what I can to mitigate major sources of risk and that I'm not sort of being negligent in my own of just combining these things without really thinking about them intentionally. If the injury happens or starts to happen, working towards the accurate diagnosis, that's again where the education comes into play. That's where maybe sending the athlete to the doctor with a, hey, here's the material, here's the risks from, from rowing. Please be careful with, with these factors because here's what you might not know about rowing. Again, I, I hope you do. I respect your knowledge about general body things, but here's our wacky sport that we do. We sit down, so hip flexors are always tight. We're always in this range of motion. Uh, and we do it really hard and really fast, just so you know. <laughs> Let's work towards getting an accurate diagnosis as much as possible so that we can respond appropriately. Responding appropriately usually involves immediate <coughs> offloading, so let's find pain-free, I just noticed the tears were still like this, appropriate. Uh, yeah. um, but let's find a pain-free activity that the athlete can do so that we're still keeping them engaged not what I always hated seeing was, oh, okay, my back hurts. I'm going to take this quarter off and I'll see you next quarter. It never, it never works out that way. Uh, so let's, let's find pain-free activity for the athlete. We can almost always do something. This is another great place for strength training. We actually had an athlete who was struggling with a repeat rib stress injury uh, problem. And so for six weeks, we just said, okay, we're, we're, we're not, we're not going to erg. We're going to do a spin bike so you can still do that at below ventilatory thresholds. You're not putting stress on the ribs by heavy inhaling and exhaling. Uh, and we're going to do, I had access to a belt squat machine uh, where the athlete wears a hip belt like this and it has a big old carabiner in the middle, hook it up to a weight. And so they could do heavy squats without loading the, the spine and the ribs at all. Uh, and he came back after six weeks and actually PR'd on his previous erg test from before what he had done because he was in good aerobic shape. He was in really good strength shape, and he had avoided aggravating his injury for six weeks. So after a couple week progression, he could return back to doing better than he was doing before. Um, so I, I really love my opportunity as a strength coach for finding these different avenues for athletes to still be able to work hard. Yeah, question? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, finding, finding different things. Maybe it's single leg activities that the athlete can't do, can't, can't do double leg activities or avoiding torso loading. There's, there's almost always something we can do besides bed rest. You know. Rehabbing with a medical professional. I stay out of rehab because I'm a strength coach. I only went to four years of squat, did a master's degree, but I didn't go to doctor school um, and I don't have the clinical experience. So I'm really fortunate to know some really good growing physical therapists who I can refer people to, um, either for like an online consultation or for in-person work. Having a PT who knows what they're doing with rowers is invaluable. Uh, and there's probably someone, especially if you're near a major sort of metro center, there's probably somebody who knows rowing in, in that area. Um, and so if that's something you're looking for, um, let me know. I've got cards up at the front. Um, I'm part of a couple different Facebook groups where we try to connect people with these resources. So that's, that's something we could do in 2019 that we really couldn't do for, for long before. Uh, so that, that needs to be done with a medical professional and also with athlete engagement so that hopefully the athlete is... is is investing in their own rehab process, not that it's just, oh, I go to the back of the boathouse and, and do you know whatever this is, or I'm totally separate from the team. Like I'm always working to keep the athlete engaged and, and keep them involved and around the team, and it's the social connection, it's the mental connection, and, and it's starting to cut down on some of those fear avoidant behaviors when they are able to return. And then plan, planning for return, again, including the athlete, educating them on on what the greater plan is, progression from injury. There, there is a bit of a gap between when a physical therapist says you're cleared to go be a normal person and when we can get a normal person to go fast over 2,000 meters. So that's a really valuable place to work uh, as either a strength coach or a rowing coach with the athlete to gradually building them back up to being a rower again and, and being a high-performing rower. And so that, that plan for return might be either, either progression using different modalities so they can 
continue training while, while they gradually get back up to speed for rowing. And then that goes to my next one of life beyond injury is sort of a question mark. Because previous history of injury is a risk factor for future injury, I'm not sure that there's a point where I say, well, you had a low back pain incident, or especially if it's a moderate to major one, or you've had a rib stress injury, uh, you rehabbed it, and now we're not going to think about it anymore. <coughs> I don't know that I'm going to tell that athlete, yeah, we're going to do added load rowing, we're going to do year-round rowing, we're going to do high volume erging because the previous history of injury risk always makes it so that they're going to have a future risk of re-injury. And if it's a low back injury, then we're adding that, that future risk of rib stress injury too. So I think there might be, I'm sorry to add another thing onto our plates as rowing coaches to manage, but we might always have an athlete who's had a rib stress injury using dynamics or using slides or doing cross training when we're doing higher higher volume rowing training um, just just because is it more worth it to have that athlete have the the increased adaptation from specificity or is it more worth it to have them be able to row and not miss another up to 60 days due due to a repeat rib stress injury incident so i think i think we got to think about life beyond injury as Maybe the athlete can personally or emotionally be done with it, but as a rowing coach, maybe we're always making some modifications for it. Or maybe it's just as simple as they're always going to do some sort of rehab exercise. So, so from a strength training perspective, maybe we're always going to do a little bit of extra uh, trunk extensor work with an athlete who's had a low back injury. We're always going to look a little bit more at their hinge pattern. We're always going to do a little bit more extra shoulder work with the athlete who's had a rib stress injury. So we can sort of work as a, as a staff to, to maintain that in the, in the longer term. And not just have it be like, oh, I did PT, I did it for six weeks, now I'm done. Right? Like, it worked so well, I stopped. Great. <laughs> Real quick, I just want to go through some future directions. Uh, World Rowing is developing a low back pain clinical pathway similar to how Evans and Redgrave did for the rib stress injury pathway. So they've been working on that for the last two years. A lot of the researchers who I've cited throughout this are on the low back pain pathway group. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to see that. I, I've got an inside tip that it will probably be coming sometime in spring 2020. I'm hoping to get it out earlier, but they're all over the world, so coordination is tough. But watch out on World Rowing for when that happens because they're going to get it all over everywhere and hopefully make it a really useful resource for rowers, rowing coaches, strength coaches, medical professionals. Get, get everybody in under the same tent. Um, and then further research, sort of acknowledging some of the gaps that we have, static versus dynamic ergs, uh, what are the actual effects on injury, the 60 second break per the 10 minutes continuous, let's see that actually tested. Again, if you've got 50 or 60 athletes and you want to give it a try, um, let a researcher know and maybe they can work it out. And then strength training interventions too. There's not a lot that we know about what can I do specifically to reduce ri ri risk of injury. We've got ideas from our own experience and from other sports that we can put into play, but I would like to see more things like the hamstring strengthening protocol and the low back pain, that was really interesting to be able to see, hey, we've done this for six months and here's what the actual connection was. And then return to rowing protocols, knowing more about what kind of, of training actually aggravates injury. Some athletes will say, well, the high intensity stuff is actually okay for me, so I can do more of that as I progress up to the low intensity, higher volume trainings. Other athletes are the other way around. So in addition to the further research on special populations, masters, adaptive rowers, Etc. I'd also like to see more work on, on these general topics. And I, on my website, this is where you can read more, more about a lot of this. It's rowingstronger.com. I also have books that go more into the uh, periodization and programming element. It's actually looking more at that side of things, less on the injury side of things. Um, and I'm always reviewing research and, and, put, and putting it out and into my own writing for how we can mobilize new events, new research that happens, and get it into uh, co coach and athlete education. So. Thank you. I'm, I'm right up to it. I'm going to stick around. I'm just driving back to Vermont after this. So uh, I'm going to stick around for questions. We have a couple minutes for, for, for any more than anybody has to greater picture. Keep training. Yeah. 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 Is that, is that so hurt, hurt, yeah. or? Yeah. How do you teach them the difference between back pain and that's a huge challenge working with new new athletes in any situation. I mean, the personal trainers get into that same thing with taking somebody who's been sedentary and now being active is like, what is hurt? Um, so I think there we're getting maybe more into, into sport and exercise uh, psychology, um, but starting to introduce those movements in a way that they can sort of gradually build up. So not doing like a deadlift max on the first day, 
uh, which I'm sure you weren't doing anyway. But but it, but if we could start with a reduced range of motion or a reduced intensity or something that's kind of gradually introduced into this again, like what Noel was saying, the 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 progression is just as important as the ultimate uh, activity that they're doing. Um, one of the things that I've done is in, in in the weight room, I'll teach athletes how to fail like on the first day. So we'll either do like a, a box jump onto like a soft plyo box and make those now that are made out of like rigid foam so that you're not cutting the heck out of your shins. Um, I've done like a, a max box jump test where I know the athlete's eventually going to fail, but because they could just get that out of the way, that like failure is not a big deal, we can sort of introduce this idea, um, especially with like squatting or deadlifting, just drop the bar, use the safeties, teaching people how to spot. We can introduce these ideas to to desensitize the athlete to them when they eventually have sort of like with soreness. Yeah. Uh, you were talking about uh, alternate exercises when they can't erg, like yep. spin bike, yep. and how it's still great for the aerobic. Uh, I understand it'll uh, you know, allow the blood, the red blood cells to absorb more oxygen, and the leg muscles will absorb more oxygen better, but how does it affect the rest of the body? Because we still need the upper body, the the lats, the arms. We do, yeah. Uh, do those get improved as well because the body has a sort of an overall general improvement or is it muscle specific? For more aerobic, lower intensity, general system training, yeah. that, that's more transferable. Okay. For higher intensity, more muscular training, that's more specific. Thanks. So we can sort of think about that in our own experience too. If we're really yeah. fit, chances are we'll be able to do low intensity higher distance stuff on the arc and, and hang pretty well. We've seen that with swimmers or runners okay. or whatever would come over to that. But where they maybe don't have quite as much is where it's that high intensity stuff. Um, yep. I've never coached a crew that has come down to our mitochondrial density of our biceps is what's getting us on the podium. <laughs> the, yeah. the, the heart has some 200 times the mitochondria of the biceps. So if we're talking about general aerobic system adaptations, we can do heart and lung adaptations with cross training. And, for sure, and yeah, get great yeah. effects, and then okay, fine, yeah. Like we still need this other stuff too, but can can we use these in in different balances to get a to get an overall adequate training effect? Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Ah, I asked this in the roundtable yesterday. What was the question? Which uh, feed out? Oh. And the coaches who I asked said that they did not see back pain coming from feed out rowing. Most coaches think that, that feet out rowing cuts down on back pain. I don't have enough experience with it to be able to say. Um, I've heard from coaches who see more low back pain with feet out rowing because the athletes are working a lot harder at the torso. So I think you gotta look at the progression of injury, uh, the, 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 or sorry, the progression of training as well. That if we just jump into doing like 30 minutes of feet out rowing, the athletes are working really differently at the torso so we might see low back pain. Uh, but if we're gradually progressing that as a drill, then, then maybe that does have a protective effect uh, there's not research on it yet. Yes? Do you hear about any athletes using a shocks box for the back end of the year? Someone asked me that yesterday. I had never heard of the shocks box until until they asked and that I question. Found, so. I found athletes that had sore backs yep. definitely uh, said there was a difference. Benefited from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, so and the shocks box... It, 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 it's unfortunate that the yes. machine or device yes. never... Went. Yeah. They didn't advertise for it. It, it, it. it sits on the on the back of the static erg and, and absorbs the force yeah. as the athlete comes into the back. Putting both on yeah. isn't good, but the back end yeah. specifically sure. really did help with sure. athletes like who are concerned about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in all those. I would like to see more academic research on them before I yeah. stand up here and say, yes, go for it. But I mean, that's there's always going to be that gap between academic research and in the trenches technology, what we're actually doing, what we're actually using. So, yeah. Yes? What are your benchmarks for like, strong enough yeah. to like start to put your toes into the high load environments? You know, like in terms of like squat number and a deadlift number. And yeah, stuff. I don't really buy predictives from the gym to the rowing. Okay. So what I like to do is work with the rowing coach, look at the rowing metrics, and then work backwards from what, from what we're doing at the gym. Just because, I mean, you're tall, I'm not as tall, chances are I'm going to be able to deadlift more because that bar is way down there for you, and it's relatively higher for me. I mean, we can go to the gym afterwards and, and, and test that, but, uh, but I mean, it, it, it's a basic idea that, that if, if you're 6'5 and the deadlift bar's there, then, it, then there's mechanical advantage. Rowers aren't built for max strength. Long femurs, long, long, long levers, like the squat range of motion is so long. Um, I just, I don't believe 
an athlete squatting 225 tells me much about how they can move a boat or, or how fit they are for erging. But I do like, um, and if you were in the general talk with, with Joe yesterday, I had Ed McNeely's 55% ratio up on there that he, he did some research that the, the 2K pace should be about 55% of your max watts. And so he, he, he does it on 10 strokes from a dead stop, full range of motion at 200 uh, drag factor. Um, and I was in uh, Jesse's talk yesterday too where he had the Jensen test and that was another really interesting way to look at that. We can put all of these different uh, factors together. So okay, if, if the athlete's peak power is significant, or sorry, if their pace is significantly higher than 55%, then we know that their peak power is limiting them. And if we build the peak power up, then their sun max is going to come up too. If, if the athlete's 2K pace is much lower than 55%, then, then we know we need to increase their endurance so, so they can sustain that for longer. So that's that's how I prefer to look at it, not so much what are we doing in the gym and what's the athlete doing in the water. I, I don't believe really there's that much of a connection there to be able to hang my hat on it. I can do that. That's, that's probably it. But again, I, I, I will stick around. So thank you for letting me close out your, con your conference experience. Thank you.